Hello, everybody. We have a special guest today I'd like to announce on who will uh, speak at the top. We have our special presidential envoy uh, for the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS, Brett McGurk. And Brett will be providing you uh, with an update on progress that's been made uh, and our efforts uh, to continue. Please. Great, thank you. It's great to be here again. Um, I thought, uh, with everything going on, I just would provide, a, I've done this periodically, but an update on where we are in this overall uh, overall campaign to defeat ISIS. Obviously, a multifaceted effort, truly global campaign. My uh, focus today will be particularly in, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we have a lot of brave Americans serving on the front lines in this campaign, including uh, personnel here from the State Department. So it's good just to touch base every now and then and kind of describe what's going on. So I think first, I'd like to start with where we were in 2014. I think that is important. Um, just to put, remember where we were back in the summer of 2014, about ISIS controlled about 100,000 square kilometers. Uh, really mind-boggling statistics. Eight million people, Iraqis and Syrians, nearly eight million people living under control of ISIS. Their revenues, almost a billion dollars per year. Uh, committing acts of genocide uh, against minorities in Iraq. Planning major terrorist operations uh, including against our homeland, but carrying them out in the streets of Brussels, Paris, and Istanbul. So obviously we organized a global coalition to combat this threat. Where we were when the Trump administration came in in early 2016, uh, that's the second slide, about 50% of the territory had been cleared. We were in the middle of the Mosul campaign. Uh, we had not put together the final steps of how we were going to take down the headquarters of the, what was the caliphate in Raqqa. Uh, the president, his first day in office, said he really wanted to accelerate the campaign, focus, really prioritize effort on ISIS in Iraq and Syria to defeat the physical caliphate. We made some adjustments to the campaign and pretty much dramatically accelerated uh, the overall pace of operations. So if you look at where we are today, I think it's quite significant. We really are now down to the last 1% of the physical territory. If you can see the little tiny uh, splotch of red. Can you go to map three, please? Okay. Well, that's the right one. That's map three. Uh, the final splotch of red down in what we call the Middle Euphrates Valley. Um, those operations are ongoing with the Syrian Democratic Forces, supported, of course, by uh, small numbers of coalition forces on the ground. And there is a more detailed briefing today, I think, given from the Pentagon, uh, but our, our Syrian Democratic Force partners on the ground have pushed into the town of Hajin, which is a real, uh, one of the final strongholds of ISIS just over the last 48 hours. So that's a pretty significant achievement. Um, even as the end of the physical caliphate is clearly now coming into sight, uh, the end of ISIS will be a much more uh, long-term initiative. We talked about that many times. Nobody working on these issues day to day uh, is complacent. Uh, nobody is declaring a mission accomplished. Defeating the physical caliphate is one phase of a much longer term campaign. As a coalition, we've mobilized troops from a total of 31 nations to help contribute to train uh, Iraqi security forces, and also uh, we have coalition partners with us on the ground in Syria. Uh, we've mobilized about $19 billion in stabilization, economic, humanitarian support. Every single military operation has been conducted with the humanitarian stabilization plan, so all the territory that we have retaken from ISIS from our coalition has held. That's quite a significant achievement. We want to keep it that way. So at a point in the campaign, we're really now looking ahead to make sure that we can endure and sustain all of these gains. Um, big focus of that, of course, is stabilization. So if you can go to the next slides, please. Stabilization, we've heard a lot about. We are prepared to maintain the stabilization effort in Iraq and Syria. Uh, this will really take a period of years. Uh, in Iraq, we have completed about nearly 3,000 projects all across Iraq as a coalition, raised about a billion dollars total. Uh, this has been a big success. Over 4 million Iraqis have returned to their homes overall. That is a historical uh, achievement you, in terms of campaigns like this, conflicts like this. That level of rates of returns of people to their homes is unprecedented. But we still have 1.8 million Iraqis uh, displaced from the conflict, and that's too many. We want to see them ultimately return home. Uh, in Syria, it's much more difficult. In Syria, of course, we are not working in coordination with the central government. We will not work in coordination with the Assad regime. We are not working uh, with interna major international partners, just given the, the dynamics of the Syrian conflict. So we're doing a lot of this with our partners on the ground and State Department personnel who are working on the ground are doing a great job. Also in Syria, the United States is not funding uh, the stabilization effort, particularly in the Northeast where we are on the ground militarily. We've talked about this before, but the President made clear the coalition should help really support those efforts. And when the Secretary met 
uh, with coalition partners on the margins of the NATO summit uh, just a few months ago. We raised over $300 million. All that money is now in the bank. And thanks to the contributions of key coalition partners, um, we now have the stabilization efforts funded all the way through early 2020. That is a fully coalition funded uh, effort, which obviously uh, we will continue. So longer term, uh, we want to set the foundation here to make sure that the success is enduring. Um, in Iraq, of course, we're working closely with the new Iraqi government. Iraq had an election earlier this year. It was a difficult election, very difficult summer in Iraq. They came through it with a new government, a peaceful transition of power. And we're working very closely uh, with that government, both to sustain uh, the, the effects on the military side and also on the political and economic side. There's a trade delegation today in Baghdad, the largest uh, trade delegation the Chamber of Commerce has organized anywhere in the world this year and is led on the U.S. government side by uh, Secretary Perry and also our Deputy Assistant Secretary for Iraq and Iran, uh, Andrew Peake. Um, in Syria, I know Jim Jeffrey was here last week talking about the very significant effort to try to bring a resolution to the overall uh, Syrian civil war. And then, of course, the global coalition, uh, which is something I'm focused on day to day. Uh, we want to make sure this coalition remains intact and can sustain these efforts. Secretary Mattis last week in Otto is with him in Otto with the main military contributors to the coalition to make sure that the military contributions to the coalition can continue, the training of the Iraqi security forces can continue, and we're quite confident that we have those pieces in place. And we are planning uh, to bring the civilian members of the coalition with a ministerial here early next year. So that's in the planning stages, but we're fairly confident that will come together. And those meetings, which happen about every four to six months, have been really critical to make sure that this is a truly collective effort and we have the burden sharing from the coalition that we need to have make sure that this uh, sustains itself. So with that, we're down to really the last 1% here in the conventional military fight, but we are positioning ourselves for the longer term, and we feel pretty confident those pieces are getting into place. And with that, I'm happy to take a couple questions. Let's start with Carol, Washington Post. Hi, Fred. Um, could you give us a, your sense of why it has taken so much time to get down to this final 1% in the final offensive, then how much longer do you foresee this this taking till you complete the job? Uh, thanks, Chris. I defer a lot to DOD, obviously, um, but I've been into Syria about 20 or so times here over the last few years. Uh, the distances are quite vast. That's number. That's one issue. If you look where it's just it is on the map way down in that middle Euphrates Valley, mm -hmm. it is quite a distance. It is also the last major stronghold. Uh, we got into a point where almost every ISIS fighter is wearing a suicide bomb, a suicide vest, uh, the extent of IEDs and placements. It's very, very difficult fighting. Uh, so it's taking some time. Uh, we're also very careful to make sure that we are um, uh, protecting the civilian population. Uh, the report I received this morning from what's happening in, in, on the battlefield in that area, just over the last week or so, about 1,400 civilians have come out or being cared for, including by the forces that we're working with. And I think. Um, you may have seen some briefings yesterday about the fact that ISIS is using hospitals and civilian infrastructure to try to uh, defend itself, particularly in Hajin. So it's going to take time, but it will get done, and um, it's a very difficult campaign. Yeah, thank you. Uh, until when the coalition will be staying uh, in, in Syria? Well, we have multiple objectives in Syria. So the military objective, very clearly, the military objective is the enduring defeat of ISIS. And if we've learned one thing over the years, enduring defeat of a group like this means you can't just defeat their physical space and then leave. You have to make sure the, the uh, internal security forces are in place to ensure that those uh, gains, security gains, are enduring. So the enduring defeat of ISIS means not just the physical defeat, but make sure that we are training local security forces. So that will take some time. We also have other interests in Syria, which I think you heard from Ambassador Jeffrey. Uh, we want to see a resolution to the Syrian civil war through the UN Security Council resolution process. And we also want to see the removal of foreign forces from Syria, particularly the Iranian uh, commanded and proxy forces from Syria. But the military mission is the enduring defeat of ISIS. Uh, we have obviously learned a lot of lessons in the past, so we know that once the physical space is defeated, we can't just pick up and leave. Uh, so we're prepared to make sure that we do all we can to uh, ensure this is enduring. Now, a sign of that, areas that we have cleared of ISIS, they have not returned or actually seize physical space. There's clandestine cells. Uh, nobody is saying that they're going to disappear. Um, nobody's that naive. So we want to stay on the ground to make sure that uh, stability can be maintained in these we're areas. We're talking about tears? Not going to put a timeline on it at all. Well, you seem to say, sorry, Go ahead. me? Um, Brett, you seem to say the military's uh, objective is the enduring defeat of ISIS. So 
Does that not mean then, given the qualification uh, of enduring defeat, does that not mean that American soldiers will remain in Syria for the un, un, for some time unforeseen into the unforeseen future, even after the physical caliphate is totally wiped off the map? I think it's fair to say Americans will remain on the ground uh, after the physical defeat of the caliphate until we have the pieces in place to ensure that that defeat is right. enduring. And then in, on, on, on the civilian side, which you're more familiar with, um, what, what does that mean for U.S. money? going into money and programs that are going into, because the president has made no secret of the fact that he wants out as soon as is feasible. So we look at the resourcing, obviously, every day. So you have ends, ways, and means in, every, in any strategy. And uh, you're right, the president's made clear to us, look, we're doing an awful lot on the coalition side, particularly the military side. So when it comes to the civilian side of this campaign, uh, the coalition should step up and fund it, and we should increase our burden sharing. Um, and we've done that. So the, in all the stabilization efforts in that part of Syria are now being funded by the coalition. All that money is in the bank. A lot of it is being implemented by U.S. diplomats on the ground. Uh, I've been to Raqqa four times. I'm not going to – it is a very, very difficult situation. Um, my first time in Raqqa, we found a, a cell phone from a dead ISIS fighter that had where they had placed IEDs in particular areas of Raqqa. Almost every standing structure had an IED. So we had to train people to go in, actually clear the IDs. It is hard, painstaking work. Um, but if you go back now, people have come back. About 150,000 people have come back. That's the kind of stuff we want to make sure uh, continues. And I'm confident, as one of the leaders of the coalition, that we will uh, have burden sharing from the coalition. You, to you mentioned that. this area of Syria. Is it not true that the, air, that the area of Syria where the U.S. is funding or is involved has shrunk dramatically over the course of the past 18 months? Uh, Dramatically, but it's a smaller chunk of the country than what it used to be, correct? No, I don't think that's the case. Well, look, and the counter-ISIS campaign has grown dramatically. I mean, it started with about uh, – it started with a little dot in, the, in that northeast part and has grown. So now, obviously, we've worked closely with um, our coalition partners and <coughs> through deconfliction with the Russians to draw a line at the river to make sure that this is done in a very careful way without risk of accidents. And we've now, over the last three years, uh, have basically defeated ISIS in that entire part of Syria and is now an area that is heavily influenced, not controlled by us, it is heavily influenced by us. And we want to make sure it remains one of the most stable parts of Syria. Can I follow up on, on, this, uh, on this? Okay, so I then Lori. Yeah, Can very I? quickly on the point that Matt raised. So you're saying you're not dealing with the Syrian government or the, major, the, the other international players and so on. So how do you deal with this small area? that is east of the Euphrates, in the northeast of the Euphrates. Is it like an independent place? Uh, do people come and go wherever they want in Syria? And how is that reflected on the rest of the country? I'm trying to think how to answer your question. Look, it is um, – it's difficult. It is challenging. It is incredibly complex. And we went into this part of Syria because there were major threats to us, our homeland, to our partners, to neighboring states, including Turkey when ISIS was controlling this entire area. And we were determined to clear ISIS out of this area so it did not have safe haven to continue to plan and plot those types of attacks. The attacks in Paris, the attacks at the Brussels airport, all were planned, organized, coordinated in Raqqa. And combat teams were basically sent from this part of Syria into the streets of those capitals to kill innocent people. So we're going to make sure that that can't happen. Uh, we're now in a position where, because of the success of the military campaign, we are uh, heavily influencing that part of Syria. We want to make sure that we maintain a permissive environment and stability, and basically freeze the lines in place as uh, Jim and others work the longer-term political solution. So obviously it would be reckless if we were just to say, well, the physical caliphate is defeated, so we can just leave now. I think anyone who's looked at a conflict like this would agree with that. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very much for this. There seems to be a division that came up in the Pentagon briefing earlier today between uh, within the U.S. military regarding the hostile Shabi, the popular mo mobilization forces. General McKenzie, in his confirmation hearing, suggested that they were not under the control of the Iraqi government, and that was a problem. Colonel Byram said this morning that they were under the control of the Iraqi government. What's your view of that? Um, I didn't see the Pentagon briefing this morning, but I, I think it's safe to say some of those elements are under the control of the Iraqi government. Some of them are not. And those that are not strictly under control of the Iraqi government are a problem, and that is a problem that the Iraqi government has stated is a problem. It is the policy of the new Iraqi government to bring all armed actors strictly under its control, under state control. That's obviously a policy we very much support. 
Uh, apologies if I missed this, but you said 1% of the territory remains, but how many fighters do you still uh, see left to be defeated? And can you share a little about where you see the fighters going after they have been defeated? I get this question a lot. I just try to stay away from numbers because um, the numbers have been all over the place over multiple years. Um, it's not numbers, it's capabilities. So we, the, the degradation of ISIS's capability to be able to mass maneuver forces, to be able to do what it used to be able to do, uh, is significantly uh, degraded. So I just, I'd stay away from numbers. Um, and it depends, everyone who counts numbers can count differently. So there's a, a hardened fighter and someone who just uh, might sit in his living room and, and, and agree with the ideology. Um, so I don't want to put numbers on it, but I will say there is a significant concentration of the most hardened ISIS fighters in that little splotch of territory. And that is why it is, uh, it is so difficult, and we're going to make sure they can't get out. We're still talking tens of thousands of fighters, aren't we? Of fighters? Again, I, don't, I just want to get away. From it. I don't want to get into numbers. Um, I would say it's safe to assume in that area, a couple thousand very hardened fighters remain in that area. And when you say it's the, like the last 1% in the conventional military fight, we understand that maintaining um, the gains will, will take a long period of time. But do you have a sort of time frame for the conventional military fight? Is it going to be another year? I, I mean, ballpark, what kind of Ballpark, you're talking frame? about a period of months. Okay. So, OK. Are you getting closer to get them already? So Baghdadi, look, Baghdadi is uh, used to be, he's the, you know, declared himself the caliph of this territory and the ruler of millions of people. And uh, he now has no territory to declare himself uh, the so-called caliph. And uh, he is in deep, deep hiding at best. Uh, there have been times we thought that he was no longer around and then he would issue an audio tape, so it's hard to say. But he is in, what we, what we know for sure uh, he was in very, very uh, deep hiding, and we have ma managed, thanks to the great work our folks are doing out there, uh, to target and capture and detain some of his closest associates. So if he's still with us, I, I don't think it'll be for too much longer. Let's go to the back. Sir, you're out with the tank. Uh, yeah. John Zabeli from Air Venice TV, Pakistan. Sir, uh, the main reason to go uh, to the Syria is to eliminate or defeat ISIS. But after Syria and Iraq, they are re regrouping themselves in Germany and Afghanistan also. There were a few incidents in Pakistan to claim by the ISIS uh, having safe hands in Afghanistan. So the question is that what measures or actions are being taken to prevent the expansion of this terror group? So thanks. Good question. Of course, a great question. This is part of the overall global campaign. So when you look at ISIS uh, globally, what they used to have in Iraq and Syria was basically a headquarters in which they financed and funded and provided direction to these uh, affiliates all around the world. Uh, what we've tried to do is make what was a global transnational problem into a regional problem and then a local problem. So if you look at the Syria and Iraq situation, for example, what was truly a transnational network, and we had 40,000 foreign fighters pour into Syria over the course of this conflict, uh, we've worked to make it a more regional local problem. So again, they will have clandestine cells in Iraq and Syria. They will have terrorist cells. They will be in hiding. They will have networks. But that's a very different situation than what we used to see in which they were threatening us. Uh, similar, obviously, in Afghanistan, there is there's a very sophisticated uh, ISIS cell in eastern Afghanistan uh, that we're working to make sure remains a localized uh, phenomenon. But again, this will be that's why this is going to be a, a long-term effort. It's kind of like police work. You have to keep at it uh, day in and day out, month in, month out, year in, year out. Um, I know you you deal mainly with the military part of this, but as far as stabilization goes, um, are you seeing any rebuilding in the government parts of areas that have you, you've cleared? I know that the coalition is in control of one area, but are you seeing any rebuilding going on as far as um, on the Syrian side, the Syrian government side? Uh, no, not much. And there won't be until there's a political resolution to the civil war. That's Not just that's just that's just the reality. Not even from the, the Chinese situation. or. Uh, it is, I mean, the World Bank estimates are into the multiple billions of dollars in terms of the reconstruction needs. So until there's a reconstruction, until there's a resolution to the civil war that can bring the international community to bear, uh, they're going to be in a very difficult situation. On the Iraq side, uh, we distinguish stabilization, which is the immediate needs. And we've been pretty ruthless in prioritizing this. It is clearing mines, water, electricity, basics to get people back to their homes. And the long-term reconstruction, which is a multi-year effort, which is really undertaken by the EU, the World Bank. And we had an uh, important meeting in Kuwait uh, last year in which they uh, 
through different financing mechanisms, generated about $30 billion for that long-term effort. Um, but I'm in Iraq a lot. There is frustration about the pace because it takes a very long time, particularly in Western Mosul, which was the fiercest part of the fighting in that, uh, in that battle. So it'll take a period of years. Um, one reason we have this delegation of 50 American companies in Baghdad today, and with Secretary Perry, who visited Baghdad and revealed today, is to make clear that you really have to harness the power of, the, of private industry to, uh, to secure the reconstruction needs of, of Iraq. That's something the new government has told us they really want to do. Uh, through various economic reforms, and we're going to work with them as best we can to help. Uh, and are help you seeing people that. going? Excuse me. Um, um, are you seeing people actually going back into those areas in Syria that you've that you've stabilized? In our areas, yes. So yeah. displaced. Uh, Raqqa is a good example. Uh, about 150,000 people have gone home. So if you go to Raqqa, the devastation will kind of set you back on your heels because it is it is incredible. And you know, when I was first there, almost all the streets are totally impassable. Now all the streets have been cleared of rubble. Uh, most of the landmines and critical areas have been cleared, and people are coming back to their homes. So it is difficult, but that's why we are prepared to sustain this and uh, do all we can through uh, the coalition. We are counting on the coalition to, um, uh, to fund the stabilization efforts in northeast Syria, and I'm quite confident that we're in place now for that to continue. As I mentioned, it is now fully funded through early 2020. And uh, we'll work to make sure we can sustain that. Okay. Great. Okay, guys. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Escape out the back door. Hello, everyone. We've got a couple things for the top. Today, uh, Deputy Secretary John J. Sullivan uh, is hosting a counterterrorism ministerial at the department uh, focused on the Western Hemisphere. Thirteen key North, Central, and South American partners will join for this meeting, including Argentina, the Bahamas, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Honduras, Jamaica, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, and Trinidad and Tobago. Additionally. Brazil and Mexico are participating in observer roles. We're also glad to have senior um, counterterrorism and security officials from the Departments of Justice, Treasury, and Homeland Security, and the U.S. intelligence community in attendance. Today's discussion centers on the threat that transnational uh, terrorist groups, including ISIS, Al Qaeda, and Lebanese Hezbollah, pose to the collective security and safety of their citizens at home and abroad. We expect participants to highlight their concerns that transnational terrorist groups are seeking to exploit gaps in national and regional counterterrorism capabilities, including border security, law enforcement, counterterrorist financing, and information sharing. We look forward to our commitment to work together to address these gaps and bolster counterterrorism capabilities. In his opening remarks, Deputy Secretary Sullivan noted, quote, Transnational terrorism poses an immediate threat to us here in the Western Hemisphere. Although the perceived center of gravity seems far away, groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Lesbianese Hezbollah operate wherever they can find recruits, raise support, operate unchecked, and pursue their terrorist agendas. Keeping our citizens safe and secure requires constant vigilance and adequate resources. We must each do our part and work together to defend our citizens, our countries, and the values we hold dear." End quote. Finally, Argentina will host a follow-on meeting in the summer of 2019 to assess progress in continuing uh, identifying areas of potential cooperation. One more. In addition to saying hello to our visitors in the back, I understand you're on the International Visitors Leadership Program from Fiji. Is that correct? Welcome to the briefing. Great to have you here. I am pleased to announce that on December 11th, the United States formally returned the bells of Balangiga to the Philippines in a handover ceremony in Manila, attended by Philippine Secretary of National Defense Delphin Lorananza and U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines Sung Kim. The decision follows an extensive uh, consultative process with associated United States veterans organizations and state government officials 
in accordance with legislative, American legislative requirements to ensure appropriate steps are taken to preserve the history of American service members associated with the bells. Philippine government officials will transport the bells to the church uh, it, from which they were removed over 100 years ago, where they will be treated with the respect and honor they deserve. The return of the bells of Balangiga demonstrates the enduring strength of the United States-Philippines alliance and the deep bonds of friendship between the peoples of our nations as we work together to advance a free and open Indo-Pacific. From World War II to today's struggle to defeat ISIS and the scourge of terrorism, our nations have stood side by side. As we close the painful chapter in our shared history, uh, our relationship has withstood the test of time and flourishes today. As an ally and friend of the Philippines, we will forever honor and respect this shared history. With that, I'd be happy to take some questions. <laughs> Can I just uh, ask you one brief yeah, one ahead, on the, uh, the counterterrorism conference before getting into something else? And that is, um, the way you've described it, and from what I heard from the Deputy Secretary's speech, is I, I don't understand exactly why this was a Western Hemisphere thing. Is there some particular vulnerability that countries uh, in our hemisphere have uh, towards these groups? Because otherwise, it just seemed to me just kind of a, a general thing, which you know, there are transnational threats everywhere. Everyone's got vulnerabilities. So why focus on, what, is there some reason to focus on the Western Hemisphere today? Yeah, I'd say that the United States is concerned about the continued presence of foreign terrorist organizations in Latin America, including the National Liberation Army in Colombia and Venezuela. Um, the United States government has long considered uh, this group a foreign terrorist organization and it will remain a serious concern until it puts down its arms, stops trafficking drugs, stops kidnapping innocents, and ends its attacks. Um, we continue to monitor Venezuela, as well as other countries, uh, for activities that would indicate a pattern of support for acts of international terrorism. Regarding uh, other groups, Hezbollah is a designated foreign terrorist organization whose global uh, terrorist activity, um, criminal enterprises, and military operations uh, in Syria and elsewhere threatens global security and contributes to regional instability. So uh, disrupting their far-reaching terrorist and military capabilities remains a top priority for the United States well, government. I, I get that, but the, the ELN is basically a Colombian outfit that is that that, that is now transnational <laughs> only in that uh, operates in Colombia somewhat and, and Venezuela uh, next door. And has, I mean, is there some particular vulnerability to ISIS, Al Qaeda, Hezbollah that, that, that you're seeking to highlight or to plug to plug with this conference, or is it just that it was the Western Hemisphere's turn to hear the, you know, to hear the, the, there, the We threat. are concerned about Hezbollah-linked activities specifically right. in Latin America, including caching of weapons, fundraising that benefits the group through licit and illicit activities, as well as solicitation of donations. Okay. Uh, can I ask you one briefly on one other subject, and that is, do you have, you are aware, um, I presume, that the Canadian government has now confirmed that one of their uh, former diplomats has been detained in China um, in what a lot of people see as a, a retaliatory move for the arrest by the Canadians of um, this executive from uh, the Chinese company. Um, do you have any comment on uh, the United States um, is concerned by these reports that a Canadian citizen has been detained in China. We urge China to end all forms of arbitrary detention and to respect the protections and freedoms of all individuals under China's international human rights and consular commitments. And would you urge the Canadian government to do the same thing? Or is this, or is the arrest there, the detention there, um, something that you uh, you support? I'm not. I don't understand the question. Matt, please repeat. The, what's the question? Well, you seem to be saying, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, 
have a misperception of this, but you seem to be saying saying that the Chinese have acted incorrectly here in the detaining this former Canadian diplomat. Uh, and by saying that, without any reference to what happened in Canada to the Chinese executive, uh, you seem to be suggesting that that's, that's a, you're okay with that, but not with the Chinese detaining. And I understand that there are many reasons why that would be the case, but I just want to make sure you don't have any issue, since it is your arrest warrant, your request to the Canadians, you have no issue with the way the Canadians have handled the detention of the Chinese citizen in Canada. The, the charges against Hmong uh, pertain to uh, alleged lies to United States financial institutions about the business that Huawei was conducting in Iran. And it's clear from the filings that were unsealed in Canada, uh, Hmong and others are alleged to have put financial institutions at risk of criminal and civil liability in the United States by deceiving those institutions as to the nature and extent of Huawei's business in Iran. Uh, rather than disclosing what Skycom actually was, which was Huawei's Iranian affiliate, among and others allegedly uh, falsely stated that it was an unaffiliated business partner. Okay, do you, do you, but so I, I, get, I get that. But you don't think that the Chinese had any reason, valid reason, to detain this former Canadian diplomat? We, we, I mean, I would refer you to the Canadian and Chinese governments for the reasons behind the arrest uh, and, and restate what I've said already. Thanks. Okay. Leslie, please. The fact that you've just expressed concern about this, are you warning U.S. businessmen or business people um, to? Um, show some caution when traveling, or are you expecting to update your own travel advisory given this, uh, what, the, the tensions over this? Yeah, what I'd say is our United States travel advisory for China um, suggests that uh, anyone exercise caution when traveling to China based in part on the potential for American citizens visiting and residing in China to be arbitrarily uh, interrogated and detained. But are you specifically concerned or um, are you specifically warning U.S. business people um, to be careful? I have, I have nothing further uh, at this time beyond our, our travel and advisory. Then just, and then just, well, your travel advisory, I think, was updated in January this year. Mm -hmm. uh, what you've just read, is that part of it or is that new language? That, oh, that, that is, a, I believe, part of it. I'd have to, I'd have to go back and okay. confirm that, though, Leslie. But it's, it's available, and you can take a look. Any yeah. further on China? Yes. Let's go, Sean. Please. Uh, just following up on that, on the, uh, you mentioned that Ms. Mang is accused of, uh, of, 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 uh, of lies to U.S. financial, U.S. financial institutions, or that affect U.S. financial institutions. Uh, in terms of China, I mean, do you think it's open for China to uh, potentially, if there are U.S. executives who are involved in things that violate Chinese law? <laughs> Do you think that that's, uh, that's their prerogative to, uh, to take action there? Let all cases brought um, by the United States Department of Justice, uh, like all cases that are brought, this case is based solely on the facts um, and the law, and, it, and I, would, I would leave it at that. Follow up. It's not, not related to anything else. Follow up. Last one, China, sure. Uh, I, I just have a few related China question. First of all, um, the Chinese government is also accusing Canada and the United States for violating Ms. Meng's human rights. What is your reaction to that? And why the United States request to arrest the individual instead of sanction Huawei as a company? So should all Chinese entrepreneurs be concerned of traveling to countries like Canada, which has extradition treaty with the United States? Should they be concerned about their personal safety in the future? The, this, this is a, a legal case. So for uh, I would refer you to the Department of Justice to answer questions about uh, legalities. As far as uh, human rights go, we, we've been outspoken um, at the State Department and, and spoken directly about these issues and our concerns uh, with what's taken place uh, in China. I mean, for example, you probably just saw the news. We're deeply concerned about the uh, Chinese government's continued crackdown on house churches, um, including new reports that the Chinese government has detained more than 100 members of the Early Rain Covenant Church in, in Chengdu. Um, we, we, we call on China to uh, 
release leaders and congregants immediately and to allow members of unregistered churches to exercise their religious freedom. Thanks. Uh, Let's Western move on now. Uh, okay. just, uh, Please, uh, over here. Yes. Western, the Western Hemisphere before, so let me continue with that. Um, two weeks ago, Heather at this podium said, confirmed that um, you all had received a formal note of pr protest from Mexico for having fired tear gas into their territory, but she said she knew nothing more about it at that time. Can you now tell us whether uh, you all uh, responded, and if not, why not, or how was it dealt with? I, I'm sorry, I just, that uh, was two weeks ago, and I don't have anything for you, you have at this time. nothing in two weeks of what's happened. No, I'm saying I'd have to take the question and, and look into that for you, sorry. Uh, let's short, please. Thank you. On North Korean human rights issues, uh, the, I think uh, recently a State Department reported that uh, the human rights abuse and the censorship situation in North Korea. The sanctions against uh, three North Koreans high-ranking officers will continue until denuclearization is complete or you can leave off whenever time North Korea complain about these people's sanctions at least. What's your situation? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you say what the question is? Okay, the, the State Department released that the three North Koreans, right. the high-ranking right. officer, Cha yong he okay. you know, Zhang kyung tae That's right. Yeah, those guys, and Park Hwang-ho, okay. Right. These guys is on the list, sanctions list. The North Korean um, government right now, they complain about these mm. sanctions. Will these sanctions not until lift of uh, the uh, denuclearization? So our goal is, remains the, the, the same, and that is the, the final fully verified denuclearization of North Korea, um, as Chairman Kim and the President agreed to in Singapore. That remains our goal. But at the same time, um, the United States remains resolved uh, to press North Korea, uh, the government to respect uh, human rights. This is something we have, we've spoken out about regularly. Um, we believe that respect for human rights is an essential foundation um, for a secure and prosperous society. This is something that the President uh, raised when he was in Singapore. We remain deeply concerned about the situation there, and we've said many times before that um, uh, sanctions uh, must uh, remain in place uh, until we uh, achieve the goals uh, objectives but, that, that Chairman Kim and the President agreed to in June. Yeah, in but, but, yeah but the President uh, will have a, a, a summit talks in next month, maybe January early or in February he announced that. Why now? you guys putting sanctions, these people's sanctions list? Th this report um, is part of, uh, uh, a part of our strategy to highlight uh, human rights abuses, to, to shed a light on it. Um, and these three groups and these three individuals, as you point out, um, they're connected to uh, excessive censorship apparatus within inside of North Korea. Um, now, then I'll and I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. Let's more on Robert. More on Robert, more on Robert India, India, India. Let's go to CNN. Okay. Leading up to this supposed summit, whenever it's going to be in the new year, um, would you say that the State Department is still communicating with North Korean counterparts on a daily basis, or have talks slowed down? I wouldn't characterize it uh, in, in the way of your question. What I would say is that uh, communication remains ongoing. Robert, yes. Uh, let's go to Saeed. Let's go to Saeed. Robert, very quickly, for, since Sunday night, the Israelis have raided uh, Ramallah, and they, in fact, still are there. They raided uh, a news, the Palestinian news agency. They arrested a couple of journalists. I wonder if you have any comments on that, or you saw the report, or how would you cancel the Israelis? Yeah, we're aware of those uh, press reports. Um, I, would and I would refer you to the you government of Israel. Do you raiding a news agency and arresting I, journalists? I don't have anything further okay. to do on that. Very quickly, no. last, last week marked the one-year anniversary 
of the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, and then since then you moved uh, the embassy there. Has this been, you know, has it helped the, the process? Has it helped the peace efforts? You know, where, where do we, where are we from then until now in terms of your efforts to put forth this peace plan uh, that been talked about so much? Well, as you point out, a year ago, the president, um, um, we recognized Jerusalem uh, as the capital uh, of Israel, and that is uh, just a recognition of reality. Um, that follows up on, uh, you know, President Truman did 70 years ago, and that was, we were the first nation to recognize uh, the state of Israel. Um, and ever since, uh, Jerusalem has remained the seat of the modern government. Uh, it's home of uh, Israel's you know, parliament, Supreme Court, uh, other bodies of government, president, prime minister, and for decades, the United States put off recognizing this basic reality, and yet we came no closer um, to achieving uh, a peace agreement between the Palestinians and Israelis. So we've spoken often from this podium about um, the timing, um, and that is something that uh, Jason Greenblatt and uh, Special Advisor Kushner are working very hard on. We, we place an extremely high priority on achieving a lasting and comprehensive peace uh, that offers a brighter future for both uh, Palestinians and Israelis. And so we remain committed to sharing that, and we will do that when uh, the appropriate time. But it has not helped the, 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 the peace effort, has it? Has it moved? I mean, I understand that you recognize realities and so on, and you did that. But in terms of this step helping in, in your effort to put forth or to release that peace plan, has it helped or has it hindered that process? Trying the same old right. methods have it. failed right. um, for decades. And to continue to do the same thing over and over again uh, would be folly. Old challenges require new approaches. And that's something that this administration is willing to do. Let's follow up on an Israel, please. Yes. Uh, so two questions. One, are there any developments on the peace plan and when it will be released? And two, can you confirm reports that the State Department, that State Department officials have lobbied Congress to try to undo the Anti-Terrorism Clarification Act before it takes effect in January? Uh, and the second question, I have nothing for you. On the first question, um, the administration continues to place uh, a, a high priority on achieving a lasting peace uh, and comprehensive peace that offers a brighter future for both Palestinian and Israelis. Uh, we remain committed um, to sharing our vision uh, for this, and we intend to release the president's vision um, when the administration has concluded that uh, we are ready. Have these already been updated? Stop at that. Robert, hold on a second. Yeah. Two things very briefly. One, it seems to me that you're suggesting that the, that, that the fact that the U.S. Did, had not recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital until last year was an obstacle somehow to getting a peace agreement. Is that your position? Our, our position is we're, gonna, we're, we're not afraid to try new things, Matt, and we are, that was a basic recognition of reality. Yeah, we're, moving, we're moving some contentious things off the table uh, as we continue to drive forward, um, and, the, the, and then our recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital a year ago uh, did not take any position on final status issues, including so, so specific boundaries of Israeli sovereignty. These are questions left to the parties involved. Yeah. So how does that take it off the table? It sounds, are you saying that the, the U.S. failure to, or U.S. lack of recognition of Jerusalem as, a, as, as, as Israel's capital was an obstacle to peace? I'm saying that uh, this is an administration that is willing to take a look at the reality on an the answer. ground, and we're willing to work, and we're, an we're an work forward. So and the second thing is, gonna, can you take the question on the, Wafa, on the raid on Wafa? Does the administration believe that it was an appropriate thing uh, you know, the Israelis have an explanation for why they went in, which is what they were in hot pursuit. They were chasing uh, armed gunmen. Um, do you accept that explanation, or is it okay, uh, you know, do you have an issue with the raid on the Palestinian Museum? I would refer you to the government of Israel for an well, explanation, for more information. I'm not asking 
for more information about what happened, I'm asking for what the U.S. administration's position is on whether it is legitimate for them to do this because they had a reason to go in, or if you think it's bad. That's all. I don't need any more information from the Israelis. Let's move on, please, right here. Can you take the question, Robert? I would like to know whether you're going to take the question and we can at least make an effort. Thank you. Please. Um, yesterday, Secretary Pompeo said in an interview that um, China is the biggest threat to the United States in the medium to long term in many fronts. So is the United States trying to contain the Chinese technology giant just by punishing its CFO? So, in other words, is there any political motivation behind this arrest? None. Zero. Thanks. Next question. Uh, Abby. I don't think that we've had a briefing since two reports were released on uh, the actions taken by the Myanmar military against the Rohingya, um, finding that the actions were genocide. Is the State Department still pursuing further investigation into those actions to determine whether or not there are acts of genocide? And given that one of the reports says that those Rohingya who remain in Myanmar are still under threat of genocide, what actions is the U.S. undertaking? Well, as you point out, last year the department concluded um, that horrific atrocities um, had taken place in Bur the Burma's northern Rakhine state. And we, um, and those atrocities constituted ethnic cleansing. Um, that conclusion of ethnic cleansing to your question, in no way prejudices any potential further analysis on whether mass atrocities have taken place, uh, including genocide or crimes against humanity. Um, what the United States continues to do at this time, our efforts have been and remain focused on steps that will improve the situation for Rohingya refugees. Um, and all people in Burma, and as well as promoting accountability for those that were responsible for these atrocities. That's something we're continuing to focus on. Uh, specifically, our efforts are, are aimed at easing suffering, um, and addressing some of the root causes of these conflicts, um, and you know, to urge greater humanitarian access uh, inside of Burma is something that we are, uh, that we remain very much focused on. We've been, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll leave it at that. When you say it doesn't prejudice a future determination, is, is the U.S. actively pursuing uh, further investigation into whether these acts would constitute genocide? We, we, we continue, we're, to, we're open to, to new information and uh, no, yes. And so the, the pres vice president has been clear as well, um, you know, violence and persecution um, by the military and vigilantes that, you know, that drove all these people out uh, was without excuse. And so the United States will remain focused on steps that will improve the lot of, of, of the refugees, um, as well as all the people of Burma, and to hold those accountable that are responsible. Okay, this is the last question, uh, please, right here, you? right here. Hi, yes, um, with the uh, release of the report on religious freedom today, are there any updates on the fate of uh, Asia Bibi, the, the Pakistani woman? Is the U.S. considering offering her asylum? I, I, have, I have no new updates beyond what we've previously been said. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you Good. That was a variation I haven't heard before. What is